when, when Matt first asked me to speak here today, I, uh, and, and told me what the lives that, that speak, and I, and I know that he wanted me to talk about my rather unorthodox career, and I have had a very unorthodox career. I started in the labor movement, went into politics and campaigns, and then ended up working for a large $2 billion corporation, of which I am now the chairman. And how did, that's an unorthodox life. But because I knew I was going to be talking to students, and by the way, I didn't think there was going to be anybody other than students here, so I'm going to ignore all the old people and, <laughs> and talk mainly to you because I, um, even though I've had by anybody's measure a relatively successful life, uh, it didn't start out that way. Um, and I lost my way a, a little bit. And I recall, I vividly recall, and I seldom have an opportunity to talk in a group to people of that generation, but when I was 14 and 15 and 16 years old, uh, like many of you, I was very, uh, very anxious and, and nervous and upset and concerned about what was going to happen to me when I, uh, when I grew up. I, I couldn't wait till I was 24 years old or 34 years old, and I would know then what life was all about, and I would have a path, and I would look at people that I admire, my mother and my father, and, and people, uh, government officials, and so on, and, oh, that's going to be fine. Because I wasn't the greatest student. Uh, I excelled in certain things. I, I excelled in English and history and geography and things like that. I was terrible in mathematics, um, terrible in the sciences, and I ignored them. I didn't pay any attention to them, um, to my peril later. It was a time, um, and so that was, that was, those were my high school years, and, and, and I didn't, I lost my way a little bit. I went to college, uh, I went to college, and I got there, and as Louise was discussing, I, I grew up in the 50s and the 60s, it was the middle of the Vietnam War, and our, this country was torn apart. The older generation, our parents, were very supportive of the war. Uh, the younger generation, my generation, was not supportive. And it was much worse than what we've got going on now as far as international wars. It tore this country apart. Um, and the whole generation was confused. Some of my friends were drafted. A couple of my friends died in the war. President Kennedy, who I idolized, was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King were assassinated all during this time. And it just added to my anxiety and confusion. And that wasn't all. I mean, very frankly, I was a goofball. I, I did lose my way. I wasn't the grandest student. I got to college. I got in trouble. That's a whole other story. Uh, um, but I had, some, I had some troubles. And as the, my title says, I didn't really drop out of college. I flunked out of college. I flunked miserably when I was a sophomore in college. And the next day, my father took me, and he took me down to the railroad yard where he worked and gave me an application, and he said, you're going to go to work. You're going to get a job. And so when I was 19 years old, I started working on the railroad in Albany, New York, my hometown. Uh, the 12 midnight to 8 a.m. shift as a train dispatcher. We call it crew dispatcher, as a train dispatcher. I worked that job for the next six years while all of my contemporaries were going to college having the college experience, learning, studying the things that interested them, I worked the midnight shift on the railroad. Um, and during that time, though, I discovered some things about myself that I, that I already knew. I discovered, first of all, that I liked to work. I, I liked to work, and I was pretty good at it. Uh, I learned what I was supposed to do. I, it, was a, it was a clerical job, but I was a train dispatcher. You moved trains around, you moved crews around, you had to react to snowstorms, train wrecks, injuries, and so on. And I was pretty good, and the bosses would like to have me around rather than some of the more experienced people because I was good, and I saw that. I also saw that I had leadership skills and, and, um, and that people paid attention to me. I had communication skills. Now, I kind of knew that. It's not as if suddenly, you know, it dawned on me when I was working on the railroad, oh, I have leadership and communication skills, I'm going to be a titan of industry someday. That's not how it happens. But I kind of eased into it and realized, geez, I've got, I've got a little something. I missed the boat, but I wonder if I can rescue myself and go on, uh, go on to, to lead an exciting life. I still loved 
history. I still loved politics and all of that. When I used to come to work at night on the midnight shift, I would bring the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and Time or Newsweek magazine, and all these old railroad guys that I work with would, would make fun of me. They'd say, oh, look, there's old smarty pants reading his Wall Street Journal. I mean, they brought magazines to work sometimes, but it wasn't Time and Newsweek. Um, and I, I still had this, I, I, I started to feel, I started to come out of it a little bit. And so I got active in my union, and I ran for union office. I ran against, and it's quite a long story, but I ran against the guy that was the head of our union local in Albany. It had been so for 20-some years. And I beat him. I was 25 years old. I beat the guy. The following year, I ran for public office in the town that I lived in. I lived in a big suburb of uh, Albany, New York, uh, about 30 or 40,000 people. I ran for the town council, and I won by 17 votes. They called me Landslide Schweitzer. <laughs> but I won. And so I, I then began to think, well, I've, you know, I've got a little something on the ball, and it was, it, you know, maybe I can still do something with my life. I started selling real estate in the daytime. I'd work 12 midnight to 8 a.m., come home, shave and shower, and put a tie on and go out and sell real estate. I passed the real estate exam. Not bad. And so I kind of I, I regained my way a little bit. I'm losing my uh, equipment here. And so and I'm now going to move into the mentor part of, of my life. The international president of my union plucked me out of Albany, New York, when I was 27 years old and brought me to Washington, made me the assistant national legislative director of the union because he saw something in me. He recognized something in me. He may also have been taking me out of Albany because I had become quite a rabble-rouser up there. I ran against the New York State guy. I didn't beat him, but I created such trouble up there that maybe it wasn't just my leadership skills that caused Fred Kroll to take me out of uh, uh, Albany. But he brought me to Washington. and then. I began working with congressmen and, and senators and, and working on, on legislation, transportation legislation, and I, and I, you know, I learned a little something. I began to think that, you know, maybe I can, maybe I can make something of myself um, uh, here. And, I mean, my office was across the street from the White House. Uh, it, was, it was an exciting time. And staying on the, the subject of mentors, what, what my counsel is about mentors is it's not as if, uh, and I'll talk about another mentor in a few minutes, I've had several, but I'm only going to talk about two of them. It's not as if suddenly somebody comes down from the sky, some wonderful person, and sees you and says, my, what a bright boy you are, let me take you and make you a big, big shot. That's not how it works. You have to make your own mentors, you have to find your own mentors. If you find somebody in your organization that you admire uh, and that you would like to be like, then you put yourself in front of that person and you make yourself, uh, you, you make yourself known to this person and make that person adopt you. So it's not all, somebody's not going to just drop out of the sky and, um, and, and take you in. You have to make yourself uh, somebody that that person is going to adopt. So there I was in Washington. I met, I met people. I met Ted Kennedy. Uh, he, he was pushing some of the legislation that we were working on. He then ran for president in 1980. I was, what's the math, 30 years old. And I left my union and I went to work for Senator Kennedy. My first job in the Kennedy campaign was driving Maria Shriver, his niece, around the state of New Hampshire uh, to political appearances. By the following year in that campaign, I was flying on the airplane with Senator Kennedy advising him on labor issues because campaigns are meritocracies. Uh, I worked hard. I moved myself up in the organization. I then, we weren't successful, um, but I went on and I had found a little niche in life. I was good. I, I managed and organized campaigns, and I did that for several years after. And then another mentor came into my life. In 1985, um, a former Kennedy aide named Paul Kirk became chairman of the Democratic National Committee. I worked on his campaign. And when he became chairman, I thought, well, this is wonderful. And I told Mr. Kirk, I want to, you know, I want to be the political director. I knew I was going to get a job, and I knew I was going to get a big job. I want to be the political director. I've trained for the last 10 years, running campaigns, labor organizations, get out to vote campaigns, and so on. He said, no, no, you're going to be the finance director of the Democratic National Committee. Remember how I hated math? <laughs> you know, I, and I, 
I, I said, are you kidding? And I went home and told my I said, I can't balance my checkbook. I'm going to be responsible for the finances of the largest and oldest political party in the world. And he, and he told me, here's why he wanted me to do this. He said, a finance director is the fundraiser, is the person who brings in and convinces people and organizations and companies and unions to contribute to the, um, to the, to the uh, party. You understand where the money goes. You can do well at this. And so I want you to do this job. I was scared to death. I did it for four years. And it changed my life because what did I do? I met business people. I met industry people. I, I worked with them. Uh, Bob Rubin, that was the head of Goldman Sachs at that time, later Secretary of Treasury. Bill Gates. I had dinner at Bill Gates' house with Bill Gates. He lives on the side of a cliff in Seattle. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, I met the chairman of the board of the company that I am now the chairman of the board of 25 years ago. That's where I met this guy. That's how I became associated with this company. And so, uh, uh, that brings me to the next chapter uh, after mentors, and that is being there. And what do I mean by that? And it's probably the most important part of this. Because I had shortcomings, I didn't have an education. Now I'm in Washington, I'm working with Yale and Stanford and, and, and uh, uh, Harvard graduates, and here I am a crew dispatcher, I'm a railroad clerk, the only thing I've ever been trained to do. But I did the only thing I knew how to do, I outworked them. I outworked them all. I stayed late. I worked constantly. I volunteered for everything. I went out to, to march on picket lines in Detroit, and I met other people in the union, and I, my word spread around, and people knew that I was somebody. I've, I outworked them all, being there. That's, that's what I did. I then went, uh, after this finance director deal, I started to do a little business consulting, um, started to advise some companies, including the company that I am now the chairman of. But then Governor Bill Clinton of Arkansas ran for president. And I knew Governor Clinton from my days as the finance director. I joined his campaign. I ran the state of Michigan. We won. And he appointed me the political director of the Democratic National Committee. I finally got the job I wanted. And I did that for a while. And I worked with President Clinton through a lot of crises and so on. Uh, and after a couple of years of doing that, I went back out into the business world and started taking that particular talent uh, that I developed during that time, which was taking, and I started advising corporations, especially corporations that were government contractors, and began to uh, take some of their ideas and concepts that many of these very these wonderful engineers and, and doctors and, and geniuses who many times don't have the ability to take what their products and bring it into something that people can understand. And I, I was kind of good at that. I was good at translating what these people were selling to the average man or to the average governor or, or, or mayor or senator uh, who they were doing business with. I had a quality like that. When I used to do campaigns and we used to do debate preparation, practicing for debates, and the candidate would be up there saying his answer, and I would interrupt, I'd say, Senator, you know what? I know what you just said. I know that you understand what you just said. I don't understand what you just said. And I'm the average man. The guy that's watching that debate tomorrow night, the man or woman in their house that's watching that debate tomorrow night, aren't going to understand what you said, because I don't. And that is a quality that I have basically taken and, and lived on. That's what I've done. I then joined my company after doing a variety of, of, uh, of um, uh, advising a, a variety of companies and joined my company, ran their business development operation and their government operation, traveled all over the world. I, 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 I've met and worked with prime ministers and, and, and treasury ministers and presidents and governors. I met Nelson Mandela. I went to South Africa with President Clinton. I met Nelson Mandela. I've had a, a, a great and wonderful life, and it ended up uh, after several years as me being the chairman of this company. Now, let me conclude um, with, first of all, the luck part of my speech is very short. There ain't a hell of a lot of luck out there. It's hard work. My motto about luck is, and always has been, the harder I work, the luckier I get. You have to make your luck. You have to make your luck and put yourself there and be there. So let me conclude by going back to that 14 and 15 year old kid who was confused and, and, and 
anxious about what was going to happen to him. You're probably all confused and anxious about that. I let it consume me. I let it consume me to the point that I missed an entire chapter of my life, a wonderful quality chapter of my life. I missed it altogether. Working on the railroad when all my other friends were out there in college. My advice to you is the anxiety will be there. It'll always be there. You'll never figure it out. I was 14 years old. Then I was 24 and I didn't figure out. Then I was 44. Guess what? I'm 64 years old. I ain't figured it out yet. <laughs> Einstein didn't figure it out. Nobody has all the answers, even though they look like they have all the answers. That's half my game for my whole life. I look like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Nobody totally knows what they're talking about. Nobody totally has all the answers. Albert Einstein didn't have all the answers. Put that in an appropriate box in your life and pursue the things that you love and you will do well. The second thing is all of these things add up to one thing, hard work. And that's if you don't go to college like I did or you do go to college, which all you guys are going to do, life is full of hard work. And I'll leave you fi finally with one other thing, and that is believing in yourself. My mother, my mother believed in me. My mother always told me that you're going to end up, you're going to be a significant person. You're going to lead a significant life. I know you are. And all during those years when I wasn't doing well in school, when I flunked out of college and I did some other bad things, I made some very bad choices in that portion of my life, my mother stood with me and my mother said, you will do well. She believed in me. She died when I was 25 years old. She never saw any of it. She never saw any of the success. But she knew I was going to be successful. She believed in me. Somebody believes in you, and you should believe in yourself. And if you stumble somewhere, get up, brush yourself off, and go forward, because it's a wonderful life. I've had a wonderful life, but you've got to make it yourself. Thanks very much for having me.